Welcome to the Expert Speaker Podcast. We have expert speaker Jen Grosso. She is an expert in confidence. She helps executives turn their selves around, going from chaos to confidence. She's also going to share with us and fellow expert speakers how she's been selling speaking engagements to corporate, how she's been landing corporate speaking engagements, how she's been landing corporate clients. She's going to teach us her model on confidence, which we know we can all benefit from as speakers. So welcome, 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 Jen Grasso. Thank you so much for Majid for having me here today. I'm really excited to be inside the Expert Speaker Council with all of these amazing, wonderful people. And I can't wait to share with you all of the insights that Majid was just telling you about. So I would love by a show of hands, if you could show me if you have ever sold to corporate before. No, no. Oh, wait. Yes, we have one. Excellent. All right. A little bit. A couple, a couple of yeses. I love it. So I'm going to give you some of my insights, especially not only selling to corporate in general, but selling to corporate now. How have things changed? And because so many people who are in um, who are here in my audience live today, they're selling their own speeches and their own work around wellness. It has never been a better or more practical time to be selling the kinds of things that you guys are speaking about to corporate. There is a massive need for it, and you uh, absolutely should be able to move forward on that strategy if that's one for you. So I'm going to start by asking you a couple of questions about corporate. And first is the thing that you must decide for yourself when selling to corporate in order to be confident selling to corporate is understanding your why. What is the strategy that you are trying to entail by reaching out to corporate? And that closely ties to two additional questions. It's one, what is the problem that you solve and who directly are you solving it for when it comes to corporate. Selling to corporate in many ways is so similar to selling to anyone, even selling to you know, regular everyday people or selling to entrepreneurs, selling to all different kinds of groups. But there are some things that you do need to tweak when you are going about employing a certain strategy so you can be fully confident in reaching out to corporates. And I would divide that into two areas. And the two areas would be is, are you attempting to reach the individual are you attempting to reach and your ultimate goal is to get to the executive or the employees? So you're looking to reach the individuals or are you looking to access the corporate and go through them? Sometimes that's really about who's paying ultimately. So are you going in to corporate so you can present to corporate so that those individual executives or employees are going to hire you individually? Or are you simply trying to sell your programs that will be uh, adopted and spread out to their employees or their at various different levels. And that can have you tweaking where and how you're going to try to speak to corporates. Jen, let me just pause you for yeah. a second. Mm -hmm. Jump in. So recap. Yes. First thing is you got to know your why. Absolutely. Why are you doing this? Next thing is you got to know the problem that you solve and why it's important for that company or individual to solve that problem. So be able to articulate that. And then you need to know who's the buyer. Is the company the buyer or is the individual within the company the buyer? Right. I understood all that, correct? You did. You did. And it's about your overall strategy and your business. Why, you know, why corporate? Why are you going after them first? Absolutely. And then when you're looking at who the buyer is, you want you to look at it from the perspective of not just who the buyer is immediately, but who the end buyer is. Right. So your immediate buyer may be corporate directly and you're going to go in and you're going to speak on a lunch and learn or you're going to speak at a retreat of theirs. But if your ultimate strategy is to get to the executives to come into your program, whether that's offering high level uh, wellness retreats or something on, on that order, it may have you tweaking what and how you approach corporate in general so that you can you can position yourself the best way possible. And, and what that looks like for each of you is going to depend. And it's going to you'll have to go in and do a little bit of research um, for sure to decide how you want to approach that. So I want to go to uh, number two, which is what do you solve for them? What do you solve for them is really important because it's important so you can demonstrate to them what their return on investment is. 
Very often for corporates, depending upon which department you're reaching out to, they're going to want to know very specifically why this is useful to their individuals and what's, as always, whatever we're selling is what's in it for them. So what's in it for corporates if you're helping their individual executives, for example? Let's say you take it from that wellness standpoint. An example of that might be is going in and showing them that less stressed out executives make better decisions, which costs the company a lot less in terms of dealing with mistakes and improper decision making. So it benefits them to have you come in, even if they just get one executive to save on one mistake because they are feeling better and they're more clear-headed and less stressed. That would be an example. So it's a matter of looking at your own work and then looking at it through the lens of those who are in decision-making capacity inside corporate and, and then showing them they like statistics. They really do. They enjoy statistics. They enjoy research. And you can, there's so much out there. Even the McKinsey, I can give you a, a website to look that up. They have great statistics for you to look up that can support your return on investment whenever you're in a place where you have to submit a proposal to corporates. I've got a joke for you guys. Whenever you're doing statistics, <laughs> you can say uh, a recent study just uncovered that 73.4% of statistics are actually made up on the spot. <laughs> I don't bump. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No question. <laughs> so, and honestly, that's, that's really pretty true. <laughs> that's, that's definitely something that uh, you'll laugh whenever you're going to give your statistics, but corporates are a little bit different in they will, they will do their homework very often. And so sometimes you need to recognize as well that when you're working with them, you may need to take a little bit of time building a relationship with them and backing up what you say. And so I find personally, you can sell and you can you can close a sale very quickly with someone who's B2C. You can do that with an entrepreneur, for example. And sometimes with corporates, you may have totally sold the person that you're speaking to, but you need to be prepared for some red tape. They might be all in on you, but then they have to take it to a supervisor. They may need to get paid in a different way. And so just acknowledging that and being prepared to help them make a good decision for you makes it easier to get that ultimate sale and get you in front of them. And sometimes those statistics that back up the ROI make it easier for that person to sell it to their superior or whoever, whoever has to sign the checks there inside corporate. So always keep, keep that in mind when you are selling to corporates and you're doing your research. So I want to put this out there to you. Have any of you held back from trying to sell for, to corporates because you're not sure where to go? Like, who do you, who do I actually go and present this to? Yeah, I will. I'm gonna I'm gonna raise my hand. I've done this many times, and I know that the material that I have would be so beneficial for this particular corporation, but I don't know where to go through. So. One of the places that most people think that you should go to when you're going to corporate is through their HR department. Have you heard that before? Go to the HR director and they're the ones who are going to help you get in front of and speak to the individuals there. That can work, it certainly can work. And developing relationships with people in HR departments and who are in charge of developing their people can help you. There's a couple of tricky things around that. Sometimes, that particular department is charged with doing the work that you want to come in and speak about. And they may not be inclined to bring in an outsider. So they may be a little bit more difficult to sell to sometimes. Sometimes it depends. They also may feel that they have very restricted budgets as well. So I would encourage you, and what I have done very successfully, is to go to other departments that you may be able to solve a problem for them that helps them. And again, if we're looking at it through the wellness lens, it really doesn't matter what department you go to, those departments will do better if their employees and the people who are serving that department are coming at a, from a place that they have more well-being, they're less stressed, they're better able to carry out their jobs, they're also more satisfied with working for a particular department. So going to an operations department and talking to them very specifically may be worth it for you. So be creative about who you might reach out to when you're going to corporates. 
And again, this goes to that point number three is who are you talking to? So it's not just the giant corporation or the mid-sized corporation. It's what are the individual departments that you're looking at and can you find a way to get into them creatively? And so it could be the marketing department. I'm gonna go directly to the marketing department because I feel like I speak their language. Jen, can you take yeah. us through like every little micro step from I want to work with this company to there's a check in my I've deposited money into my bank account. So like, let's say you want to work with IBM. Sure. Take me to every step because I want to know like how many meetings are we having here? How many calls and conversations? How many people are we talking to? Are we sending proposals? Are we sending contracts? Are we invoicing? And like, what's what's the whole step by step process look like? So much power is done in the research that you do in advance, but I'm going to say that you're not only going to want to research the company in advance, you are also going to want to start the process of building relationships in that company almost immediately. So if you think that you want to go to IBM, the first step is, okay, I think IBM, I can deliver to IBM, right? So we'll put this up here. Can you see it? Yeah. IBM, who do I know? Who do I know at IBM is first is question number one. Who do I know there and what department are they in? LinkedIn is your friend very often. LinkedIn might not be sexy. It might not be the one that people feel super comfortable on. But when you're reaching out to corporates, corporates are on LinkedIn and corporates are prepared and ready to buy and often looking to buy and looking for speakers very often here. So there are other ways to get to them from other social media, but definitely going through LinkedIn to reach out and identify sometimes who are the people that I know that might work there. Also go and look out like, who do I know that knows people in IBM and can I get to them that way? Sometimes there won't be anyone that you can identify, but you might start to go in and look for someone that you want to reach out to first. And so if you, whether you know someone or you don't, you want to start, you want to connect with them. And it might be as simple as going in. So you want to make some connection points. And you want to be confident enough to do this. This can be in the DMs. This can be commenting on posts that they have. A lot of times corporates don't have any posts. They're just hanging out on LinkedIn, but they're not actually posting for themselves their own content. So you may need to simply make a request of them. So you want to, who do I know or who do I want to know? And then start that process because it can take very easily eight. So touch points means connections, reaching out to them. It can take um, it can take eight to 10. You can shorten that up. Total touch points from who do I know all the way to check in hand. And yes, we want you and we're going to pay you. Okay. So it can take eight to 10. So I would start this process, make start making your connection points, reach out. It's it's even sending them something, maybe a value. I would not recommend if you have not, if you don't have a regular relationship with somebody, I wouldn't recommend sending them the cold DM that says, hey, I have this amazing thing for you. You need to talk to me right away. That might be appropriate if you are already close to someone. You have someone that's, that's you have a close relationship with already and you've been nurturing that relationship for a long time. It's much easier to reach out and say, hey, I would like to, I, I have a talk that I give to corporates and I'd love to talk to you about it and see if you know who's the best person you can put me in touch with. So you can tighten that time frame up. So part of the research too is finding out, do they have a proposal process that they have outlined? The bigger the company, the more corporate it is, like in IBM, the more likely they have an official process that they like to follow. You can sidestep that as well, but I would find out in advance, do they have a process they want you to go through so that you know what the, those steps are. The other points, again, for research would be research. You want to be looking at who can you help? Like what are the departments that most need your help? So you're looking at departments that most need your help. Again, what's their return on investment for them? And if you can quantify that is helpful when you're doing your research. And then you want to find, when I said you want to reach out to who you know, then you want to identify two to three additional people that you might want to reach out to, that you might be able to get 
into the door. So there's often a multi-layered approach to try to get into a particular company. So a company like IBM, let me just go back to this. If you've got a company like IBM, that's enormous. It's a huge company. They've got lots and lots of departments. A lot of the time, one of the strategies and the reason to go and speak before them is to raise your credibility and get the little IBM logo on your, on your website and on your speaker sheet. That may be your strategy. And so your goal is you don't really care what department you're going to speak to. You just want to make sure that you get in there and you provide value and that they're happy with it. And then you get your testimonial from them at the end. It's a lot of times it's to get the IBM logo and to ultimately continue to have a consulting contract or continue working with individuals within the corporation as well. So that can dictate a little bit more about what you're doing. So once you're at a place where you know who your people are that you want to start reaching out to, you want to make sure that you are increasing your touch points and providing them with some value, making sure they know who you are before you make the call to them. And saying, I have this great speech and I think it would make sense to you. So once you feel comfortable with that, which might be right out of the gate or might require a couple of reach outs so they know who you are when you reach out, then you're going to want to directly reach out to them, whether that's by phone call, email, or DM. And you're going to have to make a judgment call on that and then follow up. The fourth, So I would say a key point for everyone always, just as, is, as it is in any speaking engagement, is the fortune is in the follow-up. And it's to keep making sure that you are going down the road and getting more touch points with this particular company. I would also say I used to speak about networking a lot. And 8 to 10 is a nice number. You can, again, shorten that up. And for some organizations, know the organization as well. I can tell you with law firms, I'm a former attorney. I practice law, big law. I represented big banks and pharmaceutical companies. And I know that lawyers, even in very large firms, they tend to be very skeptical, especially of non-lawyers. And their touch points are, on average, the marketing shows that it could take 15 to 20 touch points with an attorney to get them to hire you. Because I'm a former lawyer, I can often tighten that myself, and I also have personal relationships. A personal relationship that's been nurtured will always bring those touch points down quite a bit. So once you get in and you get someone who's willing to listen to you, and willing to talk with you, you're going to tell them basically this is, and you want to be tight on it, really tight on this is what I want. I speak, this is the problem I solve. And this is why you have to have me in there. Your people at, at this, in this department are going to do so, so well, they're going to be more engaged at work. So employee engagement is a really important term that corporates are using. So you want to speak in their language. You want to speak about retention. You can catch their attention, uh, retention. So you can catch their attention by pointing out that if you would like your employees not to quiet quit on you, show that you care by show that you care about their well being. That might be a way to talk to them. So if you don't already speak corporate language, I would recommend even before you go to IBM, you do just a little bit of reading. What are the important hot topics? that corporates are talking about. They're talking about quiet quitting. They're talking about burnout. They're talking about stress and their employees. They're talking about retention. So you wanna be able in this conversation that you're having with someone, talk to them about how costly it is to lose an employee and have to replace them. And so having you in to speak to their group is going to be, if they keep just one employee around longer, they're gonna, triple or or 10 times any investment they have on you and speaking in there. So that would be an example of the return on investment. Does that make sense? Everybody good? Understanding? Okay. Very engagement, cool. Engagement, engagement is the is the one of the words you can use. Absolutely. Leadership leadership is another word that's mm -hmm. always always for sale. Yes. Absolutely. And and helping them understand the ROI like if you can keep one employee not lose that one employee, what's that worth to your company? Certainly more than whatever your fee is. Yes. It's usually worth two and a half to three times whatever their yearly salary is. So let's say you're speaking. So this would be an example. I want to speak to your mid-level managers who are making $150,000 a year. That would be that would be like almost $400,000 they would save if they didn't lose one of them. It's a huge deal. Like when you hear it that way, oh my gosh, if I could hire 
if I could hire Rachel or I could hire Jeffrey and he comes in and he speaks and he gives a, an actionable tip to my employees that keeps them, that could save us hundreds of thousands of dollars. It becomes a no brainer for you to come in. Does it make sense? And that's, and just knowing that and arming yourself with all of that information, by the way, boosts your confidence as you reach out to a company of any size. You should be able to be so confident to speak to any company of any size, even if they deliver something like, like IBM. And I will admit, I am not very techy. I'm not high tech. But I often speak to and assist people who are in high tech. I don't have to, I don't have to code a thing. I just have to keep you calm <laughs> and confident and cool as you deliver your job. So don't mix the two. That's another thing I find that people very often when they're trying to sell to corporate, they get caught up in the fact that they don't do what the other people do. Like you can speak to super geniuses. Super geniuses need well-being too, for example. By the way, super geniuses also need help with confidence. And that's what I go in and help them with as well. They have their confidence shaken to the core sometimes too. So you're going to make your initial call. Know that it is possible. By the way, it is possible that you could sell on that first call, just so you know. That is absolutely possible, especially if you're really good at it and that person has a budget and that what you're offering has you within that budget. If they tell you, you know what, this is a little bit outside of my budget, I don't know that I'm going to be able to handle that. One of the things that you can say, and this was one of the most useful tips that I had was, I understand that that happens a lot. Why don't we look at if there's other people inside your department that have expense accounts? And this is something that people don't often talk about, but if there is an expense account of your higher level executives, they may be able to pool their expense accounts and put them together and then pay for your speaker fee. And you can then tell this person, I'd be more than happy to put together the proposal about what this looks like so that you can see like what the return on investment is, what it could save you. Again, we'll use that example. It would save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So let's say your speaker fee is $5,000. It's a no brainer. It's a fraction of the cost of saving just one employee. And that's really, really helpful. Then you, and you should be prepared. You should be prepared with a template proposal of what are the general questions that they might want to have answered. And that will include things like, what are the learning objectives? If you haven't done one before, what are the learning objectives for your particular talk? Basically, what are, you, what are they gonna take away? What are they gonna get from you coming and speaking to them? What's gonna happen? They're gonna wanna know that. You're gonna wanna give them some bullet points, a very brief bio of yourself. You can, you'll also give them your speaker sheet so they have like that bigger picture, but on the proposal, You'll break it down. One of the things that you want to make sure that when you give your speaker fee, that it's an all-in speaker fee so that they're clear on what that is. Any advice on what number to say for your fee? For your fee? I would, it depends. It really depends on what kind of a company. And I would, I would say what your normal fee would, is. And I would assume that many people are undercharging rather than overcharging to corporates. And so for corporates, it is not uncommon for them to pay five to $10,000 for somebody to come in. Whether and let's say they really push, by the way, let's say they really push back and say, I don't have for my little department doesn't have a, a budget. You can ask them, okay, what's your budget for lunch and learns? Which would be like a 20 minute talk. Definitely not an hour, not a training, not a big thing. What? was your budget for that? And let me see if I can work within that. And then that gets you in the door. Again, that's about what's your strategy. If your strategy is I want IBM, then you might be okay with a 20 minute lunch and learn. And then that's your, by the way, that might also be your step in the door, which then gets you to the $10,000 speech later. And, and recognizing that it can take a little bit of time, depending upon how much red tape there is. A mid-sized company might be easier to work with and prepared to pay 10 grand and not blink an eye at it. And, and Majid has many times uh, spoken. I know he's spoken about how you can talk with them as well about how to, how to say, okay, if that budget is not, if that's not within your budget, let's see how I can give you this value and what you can give me back, which might be, okay, I'm speaking to 
the procurement department on this, if you can connect me to the person who's in charge of your event so that I can speak at your corporate retreat, then making that connection, those internal connections for you within the company so you can speak to multiple, multiple departments, that can help you quite a bit as well. Does that make sense? I want to make sure we take some time to go over your methodology for building confidence. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I also want to give folks the opportunity to ask questions about selling to corporate. Any yeah. questions? Can I add one last step just so you know? By the way, if so a proposal can sometimes, uh, because there's the lawyer in me, I'm not your lawyer, I'm going to do that little disclaimer for myself, but make sure that you do have a contract that you're ready if they do want to go to a formal contract and you might need to get that looked at by an attorney. Sometimes though, your proposal may just be accepted as a term sheet and that'll be good enough. And if that's good enough, it's often not worth trying to push them on something more formal because then it might get caught up in their legal department for like two months. So that's a little extra tip from me. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Mary Lou. Yeah. I'll ask, do people ever ask, so if you're new, do they ask for, like, do you have a YouTube or a, or a video or something? Do you ever get asked for anything like that or an example of your work? Absolutely. That comes, that comes up for sure. I've had that happen. Can you send us a video? Can you send us some video clips? They won't ask as specifically as that very often that we need to see that you're on YouTube specifically. I've never run across that. They'll simply say, can you send us just a little clip just so we can see if they haven't already seen you. Providing them with some assets, so some of your speaking assets, whether that's your speaker one sheet, some examples of you speaking on video and audio, that can be that can be helpful. So to the extent that you can, I, I would provide that for sure. Just as a clarification, follow-ups, what have you used or did you do some of your own just at home or in, in an office or something like that? And, and what type of like post editing, et cetera, did you do, if that's an appropriate question? I have, so what I have done is I do have an edited video that I've done. So a short video trailer, I have that. I have also though pointed them to less produced video as well, especially if the particular talk that I'm doing for them falls into another subject area that's not within, and I wanted them to see something specific. For example, I am the confidence coach inside a marketing program that's that's out there, and I sent them a clip from a module within there because it directly hit upon the point that what we, they wanted me to speak on. And it was a module that was about the imposter syndrome. So I was asked to come in and speak to their women leadership about imposter syndrome and how they could get past that as they were moving forward so they could be better leaders. So what I showed them was a module, and then I also pointed to them to a couple of YouTube videos where I had been on various podcasts where the podcast host posted that and I was specifically speaking to imposter syndrome. And I and again, it's about making it as easy as possible for them. So I pointed out, I'm speaking about imposter syndrome from this point to this point. And I gave them, you know, from like minute 10, 27 to this minute to make it easier for them so you're not wasting their time. And that's been very, very effective. So it's really about listening to them on the call and then making it as easy for them as possible to make a buy decision. Jeffrey, you had a question? Yeah, Jen, uh, great job. Great information. Do you have a ratio of um, booking speaking engagements versus lunch and learns? Because this is the first time I'm hearing, hearing about lunch and learns, which I think is a really great potential uh, fallback if you can't get a, you know, a bigger speaking, speaking engagement. I think that's, a, uh, so I don't have one. And okay. I don't, and I, and it really depends because a lot of companies don't even do them. I, yeah. I just know it's a, it's, I know it's something that can be done. It's also something that I've proposed. I've gotten a lunch and learn when they don't do lunch and learns. It's not okay. a standard thing that they do. And they're like, oh, you'll do a lunch and learn. Absolutely. So offer that up as part of your arsenal. Listen, if you just like to get a taste of this so that you can bring it up and then you can have me come back and speak. At, uh, at another event or to speak higher up the chain, something like that. You can tell them you'll do awesome. something that's super simple okay. to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done Lunch and Learns before. So this is a, a great potential segue into the bigger speaking platform. Yeah. 
It's a Thanks. low investment buy-in for them and it'll get you in the door. Now I, I would also reserve that for, you know, the big, the big mm. companies, the names you really want or the ones, if it's something you really want and they're resistant at all, how do you feel about a lunch and learn? It's a, it's a way in the door. Sure. Thanks. It's a way to nurture the relationship. Absolutely. Was there another question? I thought I saw another hand. Yes. Hey, Rachel. Uh, piggybacking off what Mary Lou said for people starting out, what sort of speaker resume are corporates expecting from somebody who's new on the scene? They want you to be an expert for sure. So they're going to want to see something usually. Okay. But I would say I wouldn't get caught up on it. And this will be like a nice segue into my confidence talk and about being confident in general is all of you, you're in the expert speaker council. All of you are already experts in your own right. So don't forget that you have your own specific expertise. And yes, they like that packaged in a nice and neat way. So if you do have certifications that support what you do, if you do have education, Putting that in a nice, neat resume, not a resume necessarily, but they don't need, you don't need a professor level for a page, you know, CV that details everything that you have ever done. A regular speaker sheet will be enough. No matter where you've spoken, you can tell them that you have experience speaking. They're, the main focus is going to be, are you competent enough to deliver the message that you're there to deliver? So you do want to position yourself as you are a subject matter expert that can deliver this message in a way that their employees or their departments need it. Does that make sense? Yeah. How much does your specific prior speaking experience play once you get into the bigger pitches? So moving from, say, like the local Rotary Clubs and businesses to IBMs and et cetera. Your prior experience matters. I mean, if you want to go in and you want to do a keynote speak at Microsoft and you want to get paid $100,000 a year, yes, they're going to look at it differently. So, and again, so that's that's where if you can go in and nurture these relationships with something like a lunch and a learn, speaking to a smaller group. Um, one of the ways that I got into a lot of places was as um, a women's leadership expert and going in and speaking to their women's committees within an organization. And the smaller ones are constantly looking for ways that they can up level and upgrade their offerings to their employees. And so it just has to be of value to them, if that makes some sense. So focusing on some of these affinity groups that might align with our unique background would be a good way to jam our foot in the door. Absolutely. And you just want your foot in the door and then you want to continue to nurture that and get them to ask you back. So when you're, when you're planning your strategy on this, you want to have some steps like my goal is at the end of this to have another ask and then to continue with the follow-up with them. I'm so glad that you loved that and the great results that you had. Have you considered bringing me in to speak to the larger organization for this particular issue? And I don't, I don't know exactly, you know, how that would be. It would, it really depends on the company, but ask them and then stay in touch with them and know as well. So it's, it's almost like also consider like conferences, right? When you go to conferences, if you want the keynote speech, you are going to need to have more credibility built up and your ability to prove it, but your ability to get into the side rooms, you know, for the smaller talks is a lot easier. And you just want to do, take that step before you get in. I don't want you to underestimate that first part. Building the relationships is the number one part. So be building your relationships now. If you even think there's a chance you want to talk at a particular corporation, start building your relationships. Start closing the gap on those number of touches now. Because someone who um, likes you and appreciates you and knows you as an expert who can go in and advocate for you on the inside, you're going to get in a lot faster. And often when that's the case, when someone says, Hi, have you met? So I have someone right now who reached out to me because I posted on Facebook that I was uh, giving a talk about corporate talks. Someone this today reached out in a DM. Can you get me some info on what you speak about? I want to make sure that you're speaking at my company and it's a pharmaceutical company. They like me. They know me. They've known me for years. They know I say great things. 
And they're like, can you just give me what I need so I can put it in so I can get you there? And they'll advocate for me. So don't underestimate the relationships. All right, what do I have, Majid? 10 minutes, who's ready for confidence? We're gonna, you're gonna get like, you're gonna get it so fast. Okay. So this is for you as individuals and also for the people that you work with. Because confidence is, I believe, absolutely intertwined with your well being. One supports the other all the way. Okay. And um, that's part of the reason why I'm in this group and why I love you guys. All right. So confidence in psychology circles very often talks about, and you can tell me if you've heard this, there's the confidence competence loop, okay? So what this means, and you'll often hear people say like, he or she is too confident because they don't have enough competence. And this is actually where you guys are all going. What do I need? What are the things that I need? If am I not gonna be seen as an expert? Can I get all of this stuff? Competence is important, but it is by nowhere near the most important thing when it comes to confidence, okay? So competence, can increase your capacity for more confidence, but confidence actually starts with all of the time. I don't believe it's a spiral. I don't believe it's a, a loop at all. I believe it's a spiral, okay? So I believe there are levels of confidence and you are moving up and down the spiral at all times. I also believe that it starts with chaos and chaos happens for everybody. By the way, chaos in my model is not only about disaster striking, it is also about opportunity. And I think this is one of the most fascinating things is that people often feel internally chaotic when they have an opportunity they don't feel ready for. They don't feel confident enough to chase after. Corporates may be a place where you're like, oh, I can do this, but I don't know if I can do it for corporate. Well, that's just a thought and not the truth. It's just a thought and not the truth, which brings us to the second part of the model, which is your thoughts. Okay, so you wanna identify this chaos. What's going on inside of me? What is holding me back? So this is what people talk about. I have like limiting beliefs, limiting thoughts. I'm not going to my potential. It's basically because you feel chaos in some way and you're staying stuck, okay? Or you've gone backwards down the spiral. So you identify it. Is this an opportunity? Is this a challenge for me? Is this a massive disaster? All right, what are my thoughts about that? And, and then you question them right away. So there's a number of ways when people work with me that we go through. We identify what their thoughts are. What are the ones that are holding them back? Basically, what are their thoughts that are not confident right now that are keeping them stuck and not getting into action? This is closely, closely intertwined with our body. And right here is what I talk about, which is biohacking your confidence, okay? So we go from, I take a mind-body approach to confidence, and I want everyone to know that you have the ability to access confidence, real, authentic confidence, not this fake it till you make it BS, real confidence inside of you by playing with your hormones. Because your hormones, and basically just generally, I know you are all so versed in wellness and, and you have many of you have medical backgrounds. The reality is in layman's terms is you're too stressed out and it's messing with your thoughts that are making you not feel confident, that are keeping you from acting or taking action in a way that's really good and, and shows you off as the confident person that you are. So you can, there is a great TED talk by Harvard professor, Amy Cuddy. If it's okay with you, Majid, I'll throw it into the group so people can watch it. And they talk about the difference between cortisol, which is a confidence killer, by the way, and testosterone, which is a confidence booster. And body positioning, how you are holding yourself, how you are carrying yourself has much to do with whether or not you can feel confident in the moment and then start to manage your thoughts. So this part here kind of goes back and forth with one another. These parts can kind of spiral around each other. If you are finding in the moment that you are too stressed out to have solid thoughts that keep you feeling confident, you can use body position, sometimes breath work, 
and generally like working on wellness practices will help you manage your thoughts and deal with whatever this chaos is. I'm gonna give you one of them, which is from Amy Cuddy and some others that she her research was based off of. It is only a temporary solution, but it will often get you into that next part, which is which is action, okay? And in order to take action, you have to manage your stress and your thoughts to be able to take it. So I want everyone in here to do this with me. I'm gonna actually, oh, let's see if I can step back a little bit. You know the V for victory? Give me the V for victory. Can you all give it to me? Excellent. Do you know that if you hold this position for two minutes straight, it will actually lower your cortisol and up your testosterone? Has anyone heard that before? Give me a thumbs up if you've heard that before. You can bring it down. Okay, yes, there have been studies that have shown this. This has a lot to do with body posture too. It's opening the chest. It will within two minutes, if you hold it, opening your chest, standing in the, like the superhero pose. Um, my camera's not good, okay? This will change how you are feeling, which will help you take action, okay? And I'll send you that so you guys can see it. This action part is really important. And what I talk about it is, I talk about your, your, um, your CAS. Critical action steps. You've identified your chaos. You're managing your thoughts in your body. The next step is let me write out what my critical action steps are and what I believe they are. In this spot, when we look at it really in depth, you may need to get help here. You may need to get the help of an expert to deal with whatever your opportunity or your challenge is. You guys are hired, you've hired Majid to help you with the opportunity for speaking. So he's helping you identify what your action steps are. You figure out what they are and know full well that you won't perfectly figure out what they are. There's no room for per perfection in here. And when I work with clients specifically, we talk about a lot of the things that come up that block your confidence, like imposter syndrome, people pleasing, perfectionism. All of those things can impact this part here, your critical action steps. This is your strategy. This is, you know, what do we need to be doing to get to our ultimate, um, our ultimate goal, okay? And when we're here in this action space, one of the most important part is this is also testing what we think will get us to our goal. And by the way, our goal often involves mastery of something. Right. So we're talking about going in and speaking to corporates. You want to get to a place where you're a, a master at speaking to corporates. So there's no question about you getting onto the keynotes and the hundred thousand dollars and all of that. You want to get here. You need to spend a lot of time in this critical action steps. You take the steps. You need to assess them. Were they were they effective? Did they work? You need to determine whether or not you uh, need to adjust anything that you're doing and then continue to manage your thoughts around that, keeping yourself out of stress, and then decide if you're gonna keep moving on. This might involve, okay, well, I didn't know I needed this other expert. So oftentimes this part involves, how do I need to delegate? Who do I need to bring on to make me more competent? This is where the competence comes in or the competence building, I should say. And this here, reaching the goal is where you are in full mastery. And like I said, this is a spiral. This goes around. Once you achieve mastery of a particular area, inevitably, chaos can come again. And chaos can come again in a different area, an area of your life, an area of your business, an area of your work. It can come up again and again. You can have multiple chaos moments or, or scenarios that you need to deal with. And also the tricky part is when something that you felt that you had mastered in the past that you're in that place. One of the places that I work with clients the most on is when they already thought they were in a place of mastery and some external factor has knocked them off, off of their footing and they then find themselves in chaos and then they are again paralyzed or not performing at their best. And they're not used to that. I only, I don't work with average people. I work with people who are performing at the highest levels. And one of the Myths is that if you are a master, if you are somebody who's a high performer, a top performer, someone who's at the top of their game, that you'll be confident forever as if confidence is static. It is not. It is something that you need to practice and regularly go back to thoughts, 
How are we managing our stress? How are we taking care of our body so that we're set up in the best way possible to be our most confident self? So that is it in a nutshell of the chaos to full confidence model. Thank you, Majid. Jen Grasso, and can you tell us the term, the, are you going to use that, uh, the B word term? The B word term. Oh, the one I wrote in there a little bit. Yes, I am starting something called the Ambitious Bitch Collective. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It is for high performers, top performers, by the way, not just women. You can be an ambitious bitch regardless of your gender, just in case. <laughs> oh. And it is a it is a membership program for top performing executives and entrepreneurs who want to come inside a community where you'll be learning all sorts of things about business, about confidence, about how to take care of yourself in a way that helps you perform at your absolute best. And I have 25 years of experience coaching. I was an attorney, multi-time business owner, and I have a lot of fun helping people step into their full confidence so they can do amazing things and bring their work to everyone else. So I'd love to offer it to your group, Majid, if you'll let me. Of course, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, Jen Grasso. And Jen, what's the best way to get a hold of you? The best way to get a hold of me is to reach out and follow me at my website, boldfireinstitute.com. You can also find me um, on LinkedIn and Instagram and on Facebook as Jen Grasso. All right. And that concludes our episode of the Expert Speaker Podcast. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you for listening to the Expert Speaker Podcast. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating so that more people can discover the Expert Speaker Podcast and so more people can be empowered to share their message. Be sure to go to www.expertspeaker.com and take the masterclass to learn how to grow your business and make money speaking. It's totally free and will change your business. If you're ready to work with Expert Speaker, you can apply. Just go to expertspeaker.com slash apply and someone from our team will be in touch with you to help you grow your business with public speaking. That's expertspeaker.com slash apply. We'll see you in the next episode.